Hello everyone, Sean Ferrick here, and I'm thrilled to be telling you that this video is brought to you in partnership with Surfshark, but more on that now in a little bit. To many, Enterprise is considered the red-headed stepchild of the Star Trek franchise, although some people have changed that opinion now that there's more to pick from. But even in this prequel series, there was some fantastic episodes about the main cast, and there was some fantastic episodes about not the main cast. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are the 10 best Star Trek Enterprise episodes not about the main cast. Number 10, Carpenter Street. This one might be a little bit controversial because some people, I think fairly, would say that it's not a fantastic hour of television. And the plot is a bit thin. Star Trek has had a tendency to take its characters and drop them into modern settings. Voyager, Future's End, Parts 1 and 2, 1996. Uh, all right, Next Generation, Time's Arrow, a little bit different. Here, you have Archer and T'Pol are sent back to early 21st century Earth, and there's a surprise waiting for them. I'm not actually talking about the fact that Negan is sitting there with Lucille ready to cave in Archer's skull, or, well, Jeffrey Dean Morgan is there anyway, in a role that would make him nearly want to quit acting. No, that's not what makes this episode good. What makes this episode good is Leland Orzer. Leland Orzer is one of those actors who has been in everything and doesn't seem to get leading roles. But the man is bloody good. He was in Star Trek Deep Space Nine as Colonel Lovok, the changeling who was posing as a Romulan during the die is cast. He was in Star Trek Voyager, of course, as a hologram who really didn't like Be Belana Torres. Here, he plays a sleaze bag who works for a blood bank and has been selling, I suppose, the merchandise to some Zindi so that they can begin to understand the human genome. While the episode itself is a little bit complicated, overly complicated, I should say, Orzer nails this performance. Really, really, like, I really didn't like him in this. And that's good. That's what you want in a guest star. He stands out and he kind of creeps everybody out. Fair play, Leland. Number nine, The Shipment. Season three of Star Trek Enterprise, as it was officially known by season three, was primarily one long story about the Zindi arc and trying to prevent Degra from launching the super weapon against Earth. Now, in that arc, you had to have moments of understanding and the shipment is our first moment where we see through the looking glass and we see it from the other side. The Zindi Arboreals are mining chemocyte for Degra, for they've been told it's for use in research, but of course Degra's using it to power the super weapon. Greylik Dur is our eyes and ears from the Zindi point of view as to what they're doing. And once he becomes aware of the plan, we start to see that the Zindi are not one faceless race that are out to destroy the humanity. This was a very important episode for understanding that there was a chance at peace with this race. Now, canonically, we knew, okay, Earth's not gonna get destroyed. That's kind of not the point. Because we hadn't heard of the Zindi before, were they going to get destroyed? Here, you get the seeds for peace, a lasting, Peace. And it's super important in what is overall a very grim season. As we mentioned earlier, today's video is brought to you in partnership with Surfshark, who are our favorite VPN providers here at What Culture, because whenever we work together, I get to do fun stuff like this. How to partner no code is of course good eye mate anyway by now you've all probably heard about the benefits of a virtual private network in allowing you to access your favorite website shows and movies in other countries but vpns do so much more than that and allow me to demonstrate that fact with my alter ego vpn man da -la 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 -la. You kidding me? -la 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 -la. Oh no! It's Dastardly Donkey! He runs websites that tailor prices depending on your location and browsing history, and sometimes he charges more if he really thinks you need it. But that's no problem for VPN, man. 
It's payment, Poppy. He runs banks that freeze your account if you try and access it from another country. Not today, payment, Poppy. VPN man's here. Ugh, here's the grumpy giraffe. He's trying to ban Facebook and TikTok because he hates fun. How do you like this from VPN man? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, thanks to Surfshark, you can be the master of your own digital destiny across unlimited devices, thanks to the incredible offer we've got with them. Simply click the link in the description and enter promo code WHATCULTURE for 83% off and four extra months for free. You can basically become your own VPN man, costume not included. Right, enough of all this, back to the video. Number eight, regime. Again, this is a bit of a potentially controversial choice because the episode is not great and there are issues with, with the plot and also how some things are used in the plot. Very similar to the previous entry here, this gives us an insight, a little bit more, that not everyone is out to get Enterprise. Regina's a spy who's working for the Zindi Reptilians. Now she gets aboard Enterprise and she is there primarily to steal a sample of human DNA. So a lot of the fair criticism against this episode comes against the use of female sexuality to effectively get this. And also how she manages to overpower to Paul in her quarters as well. It's, it's not handled great. So what's it doing on this list? Well, like the shipment, it helps the audience to see that there is a desperation behind the Zindi. They must do these things. They are afraid for their lives. And while potentially later on in the season, some, some fairly just xenophobic ideas would come out of individual Zindi, this was another step on the road to helping us see that it might not necessarily be Enterprise versus the galaxy, that it might in fact be, we just need to get through to some individuals. Nikita Ager nails it in the role of Regine, even if the script didn't give her the material that she deserved. Number seven, Ceasefire. Moving away from the Zindi arc, this is an episode that features Jeffrey Combs, who God, I just want him to be in every single Star Trek ever. As Shran, the commander of the Andorians. You've got uh, Gary Graham as Soval, and you've also got the wonderful Susie Plaxon returning to Star Trek. Ceasefire is a very kind of gritty episode when it is the Andorians are standing off against the Vulcans. They both claim ownership over a planet and neither one of them are particularly willing to give any ground on it. It's a very important episode because we get to, we get to see the ongoing deepening of Shran as a character. We see there's a little bit of infighting in his camp as well. Susie Plaxon is not really interested in peace or laying down arms. But it's also super, super important that we get to see a little bit more of Soval. For season one of Enterprise, Ambassador Soval was kind of a prick, really. But he begins to mellow as the show goes on, right up into the fact that in the fourth season where he is, he's an ally. Of, of Enterprise. This episode alone helps him really soften the edges a little bit. It helps the audience as well go, all right, maybe we'll give this guy a chance. It's taken long enough, but down to Gary Graham's performance, there's more to Saval than you just see on the surface. This advances the story of the conflict between the Andorians and the Vulcans, while also sort of solidifying Enterprise's place as being in the middle of that. And that's something that would come back to haunt them in season four. Number six, acquisition. All right, full disclosure, when I first saw this episode, I didn't like it. I sat there and I went, no, you don't know who the Ferengi are. You're not allowed to have the Ferengi in Enterprise and you're all bold and Loosen up, young Sean, loosen up. This episode is gas. You've got Ethan Phillips, who we all know as Neelix. You've got Jeffrey Combs, again, who just seems to be, if he's walking down the corridor, they're like, Jeff, you in? Yeah, brilliant. And you've also got Clint Howard, 
who he's in fact one of the earliest guest stars that Star Trek's ever had. He appeared as the child version of Baylock in the Corbin Might Maneuver. Maneuver. That word is difficult. So there's, there's a decent bit of Star Trek alumni going on here. This is also the episode that has Trip in his underwear. I doesn't have anything to do with the fact that it's just bears mentioning really. Phillips, Combs and Howard, they they really, they sell their scenes. They work as Ferengi. Now the word Ferengi is never spoken on screen. So technically Captain Picard is still the first captain to encounter the Ferengi as a named race. But this is fun. They're told by the episode's end, stay away from Starfleet or the Vulcans for, you know, the next hundred years. Well, yeah, well, they give them 200. I think that's a bargain. You know, acquisition is just fun. It's switch your brain off at the door, just enjoy what's going on around you and you'll have a good time. Number five, the Andorian incident. Well, this is the one that introduced Jeffrey Combs to Enterprise, but this also kicks off the, our knowledge as an audience of the Andorian Vulcan conflict. Now, it rates slightly higher than Ceasefire because it's a bloody good introduction. The Andorians really hadn't featured in Star Trek, not really since the original series. Yes, they'd made cameos, of course, across the way, but as characters, not so much. So there was a lot of leeway to do things with these characters. Jeffrey Combs manages to define a race again, really. He defined, of course, the Vorta, in the form of Weyoun, he defined an aspect of the Ferengi through Brunt, but through Shran, he literally defined Andorians. He is excellent in this episode. And you see, even though there is conflict between him and Archer, you do see the seeds of his and Archer's eventual friendship, really. And it also shows the Vulcans are not all there. They're not, they're not really telling you all the truth. Arguably, you could have figured that one out for yourself, but Vulcans don't lie. Except when they do. Number four, Fallen Hero. This episode's important for a few reasons. You could argue that it is a kind of a T'Pol episode, but the effect it has on her is very, very important. What really makes this episode shine is Fanula Flanagan's performance as Ambassador Villar. Now, Fanula Flanagan had appeared on Star Trek before. She was on Star Trek Deep Space Nine as a former lover of Curzon Dax, and she was on Star Trek The Next Generation as Juliana Tainer, technically Data's mam. Having her back here as the ambassador is always welcome because, woohoo, big up the Irish. She is the most different Vulcan that we have seen in Enterprise up to this point. You know, she seems to be much more friendly, in as much as a Vulcan is friendly. She seems to be very respectful of human culture, and to the point where she's kind of confusing to Paul with how open and forward she's being. So when they discover that her reputation is in fact completely tarnished, and she is being hunted by the Maserites for trouble on the planet, to Paul is really, really torn. I mean, this is a hero of the Vulcan people who is being pursued by these aliens. What's going on here? It turns out to be a ruse. They had to discredit her in a way because she was wanted as a character witness on Maserite. And look, nobody wanted that. So you, you get to see that there's more levels to the Vulcans in Enterprise, which with the exception of T'Pol herself, the show had been lacking somewhat in the first season. Also, she helps the ship get to warp five. So big up the Irish again. Number three, Stratagem. Now this is another Zindi episode, but this one is crucial. Randy Oglesby as Degra is phenomenal in this episode. The setting of this is that he has been captured by Enterprise and he's being tricked to think that he and Archer are escaping as prisoners from an unnamed prison world. Archer is there to get his trust to find out effectively what his beef is, but also what is his specific drive and potentially can they get some information that will save Earth. Now, while Degra does eventually figure out that it's a ruse, there is a great interplay and what seems to be a good understanding between these two characters. It breaks down a little bit as the episode goes along, but this is 
it's one of the milestone moments of Starfleet and the Zindi's understanding of each other. It doesn't exactly end hostilities, but this hour is potentially, with Azati Prime and Zero Hour, one of the most essential episodes of understanding the Zindi arc. Degra had more to give. Number two, Carbon Creek. Yes, okay, okay, hands in the air, I realize this is a cheat, okay, because Jolene Blaylock is front and center in this episode, but she's not playing to Paul. Carbon Creek, again, on first watch, it's very easy to kind of write it off as a bit of fluff or something, but it's really so much more than that. Because while T'Pol is not playing her usual character, we as an audience get to see different shades of Jolene Blaylock, which really, really certainly helped me warm to her an awful lot more. Frequent Star Trek guest star J. Paul Boomer is brilliant. Brilliant as Mistral. The Vulcan who effectively figures out, hey, I kind of like 1950s America. I, I think I might stick around. He starts watching I Love Lucy, which is a great tribute to the mother of Star Trek overall, Lucille Ball. It's charming. It's pretty consequence free. It's just, it's just overall, it is a nice, nice episode. And it just leaves you feeling a bit warm inside. Plus, I love the fact that the Vulcans invented Velcro. You can't take that one away from me. Number one, Borderland, Cold Station 12, The Augments. Now, I'm putting these three episodes together because they are very much one story. Something that season four managed to do quite successfully with a few different story arcs. But particularly this one stands out for a couple of reasons. One, Brent Spiner is detestable as Arik Sung, which was the point and the augments themselves are quite compelling. Yet, there's something they're not Khan, although obviously the whole storyline ties back into Khan, Nuni and Singh. These are closer in a way to the genetically engineered friends that Dr. Bashir met in Statistical Probabilities, except they've been given free reign to use their abilities and Absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's a little bit of that going on. There's actually quite a sad, sad ending when Arik is unable to convince them that they can live in peace in this time. I don't know. It gets me every single time. I also like the joke that Arik says, well, augments didn't work out. Maybe I'll try robotics. That's everything for our list today, guys. If you reckon we missed a big episode for guest stars in Star Trek Enterprise, let me know. Please drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And remember that you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick as well. Whatever you end up doing in the meantime, look after yourselves. And whether it's been a long road from there to here, I'm sorry, guys, live long and prosper. Thanks.